so I can do it th together like that. You know, I know you've all seen guidance about Bald Mountain. Some people are upset, some people are happy. Well, I would ask you, and this is for my good counsel, my attorney on, on our committee, um, Ralph Tucker, is that I would ask if you're going to use, use talk about Bald Mountain, maybe use it in context of the laws and rules that we have in front of us. It would help us to focus on it. I really do want to focus this on rules, not on mining, but that's your choice during your three-minute time. I'm going to ask Robert to kind of give some outline. Dan put together for the sake of the committee some subject areas that you may want to really pay attention to during the hearing if they come up. And then Robert has put together his synopsis of some information he's been able to gather. And, and Bob will go through that in a minute. And if he, uh, so if you have stuff that helps us with that would be great. The way we've done the sign up sheet is that we'll start with good representative Joan Welsh will introduce the bill then DEP, then legislators that choose to speak. And then we will do it by distance away for the public first. And we, we'll just, I'll just call out the name. I hope I can read it. And if I mutilate your last name, remember I've been there. Saviello gets mutilated all the time. Um, and ask you to come up and speak. And we'll do it by distance away where we started 150 miles. And then I think it's uh, 50 miles and then close in. And at the very end, those that are being paid to be here, the lobbyists, will be the last to speak. Um, did I forget anything, Re good representative? No, I just add that um, normally we go for and then right. against, but for the public, we're just doing it more in terms of distances. But when we do get to the lobbyists, we'll probably have those testify for and. Just call your name out. Just tell us whether you're for. Just tell us whether you're okay. against. That would be that great. Okay. When you come up, okay yeah, it. yeah, because I think we can keep track of it. And I'm trying to think, is there anything else I forgot? Senator, uh, Representative Tucker, I promoted you too. Uh, since my name was raised, I feel. Uh, <laughs> I to you're my attorney. I believe that the. Um, I, I would object to the last sentence in the instruction sheet where it says, please do not present testimony regarding mining activities proposed at Bald Mountain or any other specific sites. Uh, this hearing has a lot to do with Bald Mountain. Um, and I, I think that people should be able to talk about that freely. Uh, uh, secondly, I object uh, because I think that the, uh, the the rulemaking process that we're going through now is inconsistent uh, with the intent and language of the Administrative Procedures Act. Thank you. Thank you. The objections are noted. Um, I'm, and I, I would disagree on the first one. This is uh, what we deal with hearings is what the subject matter is about. But I will give plenty of leeway during the testimony. And I would ask the good representative, John Martin, to address the uh, Administrative Procedures Act question because that is in front of us because of a unanimous vote in both the House and in the Senate that gave us the ability to proceed today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since I was involved in drafting the APA, uh, <laughs> I, I want to assure the good representative of Brunswick that we are not in violation. Uh, and the intent of the law was clearly to provide an ability for the legislature to deal with rules. Uh, it doesn't matter whether they come the session after or they come two years after or they get reintroduced. There's nothing in the APA rules that prevent that from happening. Representative Harlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I, I think that there is a little bit of ambiguity in that, and I think that we do have to recognize the ambiguity, and so I think that it is a fair question. Representative Breen. Senator Breen. Thank you. I'm just pulling up a um, memo that came from the AG's office yesterday on this topic, uh, where she specifically says in the memo, in light of these statutory provisions, we believe the resubmission of the provisionally adopted mining rules about one year after the date of the board's provisional adoption, blah, 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 um, is inconsistent with the intent and language of the Maine Administrative Procedures Act. So clearly, we have a difference of opinion, and I want to go on record about that. Yeah, Mr. Represent Representative Martin. First of all, I want to point out that that opinion was not drafted uh, by the Attorney General. It is not an opinion of the Attorney General, and it's the opinion of two attorneys and the Attorney General who basically reversed their position when we talked to them earlier. And so when the Attorney General returns from Washington from the conference, there will be discussion as to 
with members of, of the staff as to what they did. Representative Welsh. Yeah, I would just say this is something we will need to be discussing a lot more, probably in our in our work session format. It doesn't really mean that we can't proceed with our public hearing in the way that we had advertised. So um, we'll get clarification from the AG, um, probably coming and talking with the committee. About Absolutely, and as again, I remind all of you is that the vote was unanimous. It went under the hammer in both the House and the Senate after a brief discussion in the Senate. So they have decided it is rightfully before us, and we will proceed. Any other comments on that? All right. With that, I'd ask the represent good representative co-chair to introduce. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, the representative Duchesne, you have some. Yes. Information. Yes, thank you, uh, Senator. I really, and I appreciate you honoring my request. Um, my request was that I ask for your advice. Uh, I'm really, I'm glad we're going to proceed with this because I would hate to waste the opportunity to hear from you on uh, what's wrong with these rules, what's right with these rules. Uh, so, my, uh, what I have been doing in my own spare time recently is making a long, rather exhaustive list of where people think there is ambiguity and clarity in the, the laws. Uh, what advice do we need to give to the policymakers to get these rules better? Uh, and now I'm really looking forward to your advice on this as well. So uh, in my opinion, you can say anything you want. It could be about Ball Mountain. Um, but I, what I really need from you when you make these remarks is some advice about what is in the rules that shouldn't be, what is not in the rules that should be, um, if there's a potential site that concerns you as a proponent or opponent, if you can guide us on how the rule should be changed to get the result you want. That would be the kind of thing that I can take into my notes and incorporate into advice that will eventually give to the department or to any other policymaker who's involved. So the more you can focus on what we need to fix, the better. And thank you very much. Thank you. Let me remind everybody that just come in, there's no standing room in here. So that if you're a legislator, you certainly, you're probably going to testify. But others, there's a, what's our room number? 220. 220 is our uh, listening room. And as people testify, there'll be an empty seat, and we'll make sure that we get plenty of time if we call a name and they're not in this room to get here from the listening room. No kidding. Well, all right. Now we start. Representative Welsh. Good morning, uh, Senator Saviello, good uh, fellow members of the Environment and Natural Resources Committee. I'm Representative Joan Welsh, um, and I'm here to present um, LD 146, uh, Resolve Regarding the Legislative Review of the Metallic Mineral uh, Mining Rules. I am testifying and presenting the bill neither for nor against. Um, this has come back to us after being with us actually for the last two sessions, both the statute and then the rules last, last session. Um, and I would just ask that we uh, stay open, that we have a full public hearing today, uh, get as much information as possible from the good people who have come to us, and uh, that we have a good rigorous discussion uh, at our work sessions, and which will probably take some amount of time. We'll also be hearing from DEP. Um, and uh, I ask us all to stay open and uh, continue to try and serve the people of Maine by a good outcome that will um, protect our environment. So thank you. Good morning. Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, members of the committee, I am Heather Parent, Deputy Commissioner of the Maine Department of Environmental Protection, speaking in support of LD 146. Um, with me today in the room is Jeff Crawford, who was, all, who was heavily involved in the development of the rules, um, and I identify him because he'll be with me um, both today in the event that the committee has questions or uh, during the work sessions. Um, I'm here to present the provisionally adopted rule of the Board of, Board of Environmental Protection and request your adoption. In 2012, the Maine Legislature passed the Public Law 2011, Chapter 653, enact to improve environmental oversight and streamline permitting for metallic mineral mining in Maine, which directed the Department to amend its, its existing mining rules to clarify the application requirements for metallic mineral exploration 
advanced exploration activities, and adopt major substantive rules to modernize Maine's mining requirements and reduce the number of separate environmental permits necessary for mining activities by January 10, 2014. In addition to updating a number of mining-related laws, uh, Public Law 2011, Chapter 653, also established the Maine Metallic Mineral Mining Act, um, which provides the statutory framework governing metallic mineral mining activities in Maine, including administration and enforcement rules and local jurisdictional requirements, mining permit application procedures, mining during mining permit duration, termination, revocation, transfer and amendment procedures, performance, operation, and reclamation standards, financial assurance requirements, mining and reclamation reporting requirements, and enforcement and violation provisions. The department initiated rulemaking activities to update and amend the exploration and advanced ex exploration permitting re requirements in, in its existing rules in 2012. This routine technical rulemaking provided specific application permitting and performance uh, requirements for individuals seeking to conduct exploration and advanced exploration activities. The department completed this rulemaking in March of 2013. As we proceeded through the routine technical rulemaking for exploration and advanced exploration, the department was also engaged in working on the uh, major substantive rulemaking. Uh, it did so throughout uh, the end of 2012 and into 2013. Um, and uh, there were half a dozen uh, primary team members who were working on the specific provisions of the rules during that time. That work resulted in an approximately 80 to 100 page draft, depending on where we were in the process. That draft was actually released to the public for informal comments prior to the initiation of formal rulemaking. Uh, that was a commitment that we made to the uh, to this to this committee um, in 2012, and by honoring that commitment, we actually received very good comments that we in incorporated <coughs> into the rule prior to initiation of formal rulemaking. Um, we did initiate formal rulemaking um, uh, for the major substantive rules, and began that which, which began in mid-September when the department presented its proposal to the Board of Environmental Protection and requested that a public hearing be held on October 17, 2013. During the October 17 public hearing, the board heard testimony from a number of consultants, interested parties, and the general public. Additional comments were received during the written comment period, which closed on October 28, 2013. Beginning in early November, the board held four deliberative sessions on the proposal to discuss key issues raised by the commenters with department staff. At the board's request, the department prepared draft language incorporating the board's suggestions from these deliberative sessions, including amending the proposal to allow mining and groundwater, underwaters of the state, and in freshwater wetlands, requiring the disclosure of all entities with a financial interest in the proposed activity, explicitly allowing wet waste management techniques, revising the financial assurance requirements to allow the use of an irrevocable letter of credit to fund the financial assurance mechanism, and allowing in incremental funding of the financial assurance mechanisms with the full funding prior to the extraction of any ore, eliminating the prohibition against mining on public reserve lots and reducing the mining setback from certain resources to one quarter mile, requiring that all discharges to affected areas meet applicable water quality standards as soon as practicable, but no greater than 30 years with the exception of waste, wet waste management units, um, and instituting explicit air quality requirements. Um, these are some of the more significant and major items that were um, in front of the board. There are also uh, many others, but these are the, the items that you are likely to hear a lot about today, and the board heard a lot about um, during, the, uh, during the rulemaking process. The board posted these changes to an additional written comment period ending on October 23rd, 2013. On January 10, 2014, the board reviewed a number of changes that were made to the proposal in response to public comments, and after receiving additional oral comments on the proposal, pursuant to Title 38, Section 341-H3C, deliberated and voted to provisionally adopt the department's proposal with several additional changes as identified by board members. 
These changes included allowing certain types of waste rock to be used for roads and other construction purposes. That waste rock is non-reactive. Prohibiting surface mining within one mile of certain resources unless it can be demonstrated to be demonstrated to the department's satisfaction that a distance of not less than one quarter mile is sufficiently protective of the resource, the environment, and public health, and allowing additional time for wet waste wet mine waste management units to meet water quality standards if it is the most practicable alternative for waste management. The provisionally adopted rule provides a comprehensive framework for implementing the main Metallic Mineral Mining Act and provides for the protection of natural resources, including surface and groundwater, in accordance with statutory requirements. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning, um, uh, Jeff Crawford and I will be available to answer your questions either now or during any uh, work session or uh, other um, appropriate uh, forum uh, throughout this process. And thank you very much. Questions? Representative Tushane. Thank you, Senator. Um, I wasn't a member of the 126th legislature, but one of the concerns and complaints seems to be that the exact same rules that were rejected came back. But it, my recollection from reading of the paper was the rules were rejected, um, no change to the framework statute actually came out of the 126th legislature, so you didn't actually have any official direction of what to change. Is that accurate? Uh, m mostly accurate. Um, the rules, um, the legislature um, voted to reject the rules. That um, action was vetoed by the governor, and therefore nothing came out of the, uh, the previous session. Um, as a result, we did have no direction going forward. Um, of all the options that are available to the committee, us presenting these rules to you in this forum was the way, the way that we saw, the option that we saw to get the rules in front of you for your review. Um, because we did understand that you would be reviewing these rules, this was the best way for you to have a copy of the rules that we worked on um, for the past several years. <laughs> Good, because I suppose I would have been upset if you spent a whole lot of time, staff money and resources to revise rules without any direction on what to revise. That was so. a significant <laughs> concern of ours. Well, thank you for that. Representative Chipman. Thank you. Um, I just want to back up a little bit from what Representative DeShane had just spoke about because um, I was on the, this committee last session and we, um, a majority of the members of this committee did draft a letter spelling out five criteria that we wanted to see addressed in the rules before the rules were drafted. Uh, we did this uh, the first year of the last session and when the rules came to us several of those um, five criteria were not addressed so we did give direction uh, the rules didn't address the things that the majority of the members of this committee at the time wanted to see addressed and that in my opinion that's why the rules were rejected so why why didn't you then go back to the letter and address the criteria that we wanted to see addressed when we sent that letter to you in the first place as, as you will see in the testimony that we've provided to, to you today and as you will hear um, during the various briefings, um, the department presented a proposed rule to the board and it is the board's responsibility to work that rule and to determine uh, what that final provisionally adopted rule looks like. Um, a number of the items that were in the letter actually were in the draft that we presented to the board and it was through the board's deliberation and listening to public comment and making its determination deliberations that the board is responsible for that the ultimate provisionally adopted rule came to you. Um, so it was a, it, it was the, com the letter that was drafted was taken into consideration by the department, um, but it, it was a long deliberative process through the board that ult ultimately developed the rules that are before you, t uh, that were before you last year and before you today. It's a follow up, I just find it really frustrating because we drafted this letter with these five criteria. Senator, former Senator Boyle was on the committee at the time and we all signed, the majority of us signed on to this letter and we sent it to you and knowing that these, this committee would need to approve the rules, I would, if I was in your position, I would have looked at the five criteria in the letter and made sure we hit every, every one of the points one by one in the rules before I then presented rules to a committee that I needed majority of the members to approve these rules that I was asking them to approve. So it just, it's, it's frustrating that, you know, being on the committee then and being on the committee now that we're still dealing with this, dealing with the same rules that still don't address the five criteria that we outlined in a letter that we sent three years ago. Um, 
So it's, it, to me, it just seems like a lot of time being wasted when you could have addressed those criteria in the first place. Let me help a little bit, Representative Chipman, so you know a letter is a nice thing to write. But there's no legal legislative authority with a letter. So for them to justify stimulating the time on a letter is not, they, they can't do it. What we would have done is change the statute or change the rules and told them to go back and do it, which we tried. But when the, the committees, were, if I recall right, was a rejection of the rules, which ultimately was vetoed. So keep in mind, a letter is one of the things sometimes, as a good Representative Martin taught me, is a way to kind of bring solution to a potential issue. Uh, usually those letters are sent with the, the whole committee agreeing to them. But in the case of the DEP, that's not justification for them to go spend time and resources to go forward on something. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. Other questions? Senator Martin, Representative Martin. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry for the confusion. Uh, if you can recall in the rulemaking process, uh, if you and if you don't, you know, I'm curious as to why the issue uh, of allowing mining close to public lands was written the way it ended up being in the rules? That was definitely an evolutionary process. Um, the department, um, the original proposal from the department to the board had a one mile um, zone that was consistent with other um, uh, other restrictions and other parts of the, the laws that really had more to do with visual impact. That was what we were considering at the time was the visual impact. When um, it was identified to the board that there might be um, mining opportunities where either there was a structure between the mine and a sensitive area, um, it might be appropriate to be closer than one mile. Um, or if there was uh, underground mining activities where there would be no visual impact, a shorter distance might be appropriate. Uh, the board considered that information and revised the rules accordingly. Um, with respect to public lands, again, we modeled um, the restriction regarding public lands um, after um, the exist other existing laws that we regulate <laughs> regarding. And in those instances, um, Currently, right now, the current rules that are currently in effect um, f for more than 20 years, for 25 years, actually allow for mining in, on public lands under certain circumstances. Uh, so you really have to look at uh, what the purpose of the public lands are um, you know, and what the restrictions are relating um, in order to determine whether or not there should be a restriction there. Yes. The, the reason I'm sort of pursuing that thought is that there is a constitutional requirement uh, that if you're going to sell public land, that has to be by two-thirds vote of both houses. And whether or not they thought through the process that if you're going to allow mining within public lands uh, or close thereto, that it would need the same requirement of two-thirds of both houses of the legislature. And if you don't, if, if you don't remember any discussion as to whether or not that took place, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, certainly the, the detail regarding um, the, the two-thirds vote in the House and the Senate didn't happen um, during the board deliberations. Thank you. Representative Harlow. Representative Martin. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just following up on Representative Chipman's question about the letter um, from us. I know it went to you, but I was just wondering if, in, if the BEP was privy to that letter as well. Um, I. I have a strong recollection that it was raised to the board during the public hearing process. Um, it was certainly discussed orally to the board during that process. I, I don't know for sure whether or not the actual letter was provided to the board during that process. I would have to go back and look, but I do recall um, that it was, it was uh, specifically listed out in oral testimony during the public hearings in front of the board. Thank you. Representative Tucker. Thank you very much. Um, in the rules, it talks about uh, the permittee or the applicant has to file a mine plan. And part of the mine plan is to figure out the cost to investigate a release of contaminants and conduct, and uh, the cost of conducting treatment activities for a minimum of 100 years of all expected fluids generated at the facility. Um, 
my question is, does the department anticipate that if there's metallic mining, that uh, there will be a minimum of 100 years of fluids left? We would not be approving a permit um, if, 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 they demonst if, if we felt like there would be a minimum of 100 years of fluids left that needed to be treated. What the cost requirements refer to is if all of everything that they are trying to do fails and there is a problem, what is the cost going to be to clean it up? And so we approve a permit only if they can demonstrate that there's, to our satisfaction, that there's not going to be a problem. But in the real world, problems happen uh, on, on every site, on a, site look, on a typical site location of development site. And so we want to make sure that they've got the money and that they can provide us the money in the event that something happens. And so we're looking at a worst, a, a worst case scenario for purposes of making sure that we have the assurance that they're going to give us the money uh, to, to address it in the event of a worst case scenario. May I? Yes, well, please. So basically when you use the phrase all expected fluids generated by the facility, you weren't, you weren't expecting them. It, it, we're, we're not expecting them, but certainly, you know, if there's some, if there's a type of fluid that has nothing to do with, uh, do with the site, um, identifying the cost of that would not make any sense. So I, I believe that that was the purpose of the word expect, expected. Thank it's you. typical of other language we have in other rules um, regarding financial assurance. Other questions? I have two. Do you have questions? Question, first, uh, there's been some conversation about the size of these rules. Some say they're too long, some <laughs> say they're too short. I'm convinced if we said they were too long, then people would say the opposite, whatever. Just for curiosity, I know this answer, but how long are the air, air rules? The air rules are, are, are thousands, I, I would, several hundred pages long, certainly. The size of the definitions uh, of the air rules are roughly equivalent to what we're dealing with with the mining. Uh, rules and you have to remember that the mining rules don't just deal with air or water or um, hazardous waste the the mining rules are intended to be comprehensive and so we're talking about various different media and so in to make sure that we address each media appropriately and each thing that we're regulating appropriately, it needs to be in the order of 80 to 100 pages. And that's not unusual for um, uh, significant projects in the state of Maine. So, but even with that, you, where, for example, a wastewater license would still be involved and one would have to go to the water rules to make sure that they comply with that. You didn't Absolutely. rewrite the water rules in there. The discharge license is still required. That's right. Same with the air. There's still an air license that's required. That's right. And if you're, if, if you can't design. I wait, wait, I forgot. I forgot to tell the rule, but it's five dollars. Oh, from now on, because I, I mine is still on too. So from now on, I'm turning, so everybody, quick check. This is your break. This, 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 everybody. This, this, thank you for reminding us. Good reminder. Good reminder. So turn them off. Turn off your phones. But if you want to, turn them on and give me your number. Yeah. We'd be glad to see if your ringtone works right. And go ahead. I'm sorry, Heather. No, I was just about to say, if you can't design your project to be compliant with the the air rules, the water rules, whatever, whatever, what, any other rule that you have to comply with, then you can't get you, you then you can't do your mining activity. And, and and when you go back to buffers, like NERPA has its own buffers related to that. This does not in any way negate those buffers or those those boundaries at all. That is correct. That is correct. Uh, part of the 2012 law, framework law, did do a minor change to the NERPA section, um, but I don't believe it had to do with buffers. Other questions? Yes, Representative Martin. Thank you. Uh, there's been some discussion, uh, and I just want to make sure we, that, that, uh, to, for you to answer, the, answer the, the question that I have since people have suggested that the rule that we have will supersede the Clean Water Act or the Clean Air Act at the federal level. And so would you state clearly what, how the, the, which would control? 
the Clean Water Act and the Clean Air Act would control. In the framework law in 2012 and verbatim, we pulled that language and put it right into our rule um, and actually added more to it to say, no, we really mean it. Um, you actually have to get separate permits for a number of different activities. And essentially, any federally delegated program, you have to get your separate permits, and those permits, those, those permit requirements um, remain the same and are not changed in any way from the rules. So you can't violate the Clean Water Act, the Clean Air Act, uh, Resource Conservation Recovery Act, or any other um, law that was in that section. And there were actually a few other state laws, I believe, that were included in that list beyond the federally delegated programs, uh, including Natural Resources Protection Act, I believe. Yeah. There, there are some exclusions in there, but I think that for gravel pits and a few other things, clay pits. That's right. Senator. Um, thank you for that clarification about the federal laws. Uh, governing these areas, but I just wanted to ask, did the Federal Clean Water Act and Clean Air Act and existing statutes prevent the several disasters that we've seen with uh, failings of uh, tailing stands and other major water pollution events? I, I'm not familiar with the, the specifics on that to the, to the degree. I know what you're, you're getting at, and that is, um, does it prevent disasters in all instances? No. Okay. Um, I would encourage you to just Put a dividing line between historical activities that were prior to these acts being in place um, and you know activities that began after the acts were yeah. these, these but laws but even were in, in the place. era the modern era of mining federal regulations have not prevented severe and disastrous results thanks one question and maybe it'll be later for work session uh, that uh, the good senator reminded me of which i found interesting is that you've actually created design capacities for various things for the 500 year storm that's correct. Uh, we took we took the opportunity that we were um, asked to do to revise these rules, and we modernized them in a lot of ways. And one of those ways was to recognize that the one one hundred year storm event uh, is is quickly in our rear view mirror at this point. So one of the revisions that we made, and we made several revisions like this, was to create a 500 year storm event um, estimate uh, to account for the changing um, climate issues and, and other just changing issues um, that we face today. Other questions? Heather, just for, uh, for the work session, it would be good if you guys looked at what uh, the good representative put together. Absolutely. And also if you looked at that letter, because I think when you go through that letter, you'll find that you did address many of those things in the in the, in the rules, we just never got an opportunity to discuss them in the committee before. But if you could prepare yep. somehow where in the rules, and then also if you look at Representative Deshane's stuff, there's some indication that perhaps the law needs to be tweaked mm -hmm. if we are to incorporate some of those concerns and fix them. What, what we should we do in the law? That would be helpful to us. Absolutely. Other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Now we'll move to legislators. We'll start with I'm not calling you first. You didn't bring candy. <laughs> no, where's your candy? It, it, that'll come. <laughs> All course. right. Senator Gratwick. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your indulgence, um, Senator Saviello and um, Representative Welch and other members of the committee. With apologies, I have another meeting I have to be at at 930, so that I'll come to the... Uh, You're late. <laughs> I'm, I'm a little bit late for that meeting. And also, uh, for other people here, usually when you... Uh, come back to a committee when you've been out of the legislature, you have to bring them a gift of candy and so forth. I've been told that just if I was on this committee the last uh, session, and I've been told that I should bring candy this time, and I wish you all to know that I'll bring this up with the Attorney General so that we, <laughs> so we get a, a, proper, a proper reading on this. <coughs> um, Jeff Gowick, so I was on this committee um, and dealt a good deal with these uh, issues the last time, and just some very brief remarks. I think they're handed out to you. I'm taking a representative Deshane at his word, and I've just put specific comments there. I became quite well acquainted with this whole issue, uh, both in the committee and more specifically of uh, driving back and forth to Boston uh, twice with my wife, where we read through these, it's uh, 82 pages, we read through them twice, not once. And so I was very good at these. I'm a little bit rusty. Of uh, the cross references that I have here, uh, I believe are accurate, but Last night I had some difficulty matching them up, but I have a, a copy at home if I need to bring these into, um, into 
the concurrence with the current rules as they stand, specific comments, and these are the devils and the details on something like this, and um, specific comments on subchapter 1, B3, and 4, the prohibition on mining in or under the waters of the state and prohibition on mining in or under coastal wetlands. It seems to me this is an extraordinarily important uh, protection <coughs> for water quality, should be kept in the rules, fishing, the whole question of what's happened in uh, Brooksville uh, with the Callahan mine I think is very um, telling. L, are the assurance instruments of a kind that are insured or protected against the possibility of bank failure? Uh, that's something that's not addressed in the uh, current rules. S, all definitions of coastal wetlands are allowed, uh, should allow for certainty that the sea level will be rising <coughs> in future years. We have 100, 500 year storms, but alas, the sea, or for better or for worse, the sea level does seem to be rising. Uh, the next climate change predictions <coughs> are that the Northeast will become wetter and experience more and severe floods in future years. The definition of a floodplain should take account of this. Um, PP sedimentation and turbidity may also harm stream habitat. I think this is a section that should be tightened. Uh, triple K, there's no need to perpetuate the fiction that a corporation is a person. The word entity must be substituted when rules refer to a corporation, agency, or other non-human legal entity. I think this is quite important, um, certainly for me it is. Um, a quadruple E, I don't see how one can guarantee the water will be retained on only one property given the possibility of earthquakes, which certainly exist in Maine or other natural phenomenon. I think this needs clarification as well. Under subchapter 4, the board should require mining application to pay 100 percent of financial assurances up front, not 50 percent as the draft rules allow. In addition, the DEP should select a qualified third party, a third party, to verify the amount of financial assurance and ensure that it's sufficient to pay for the full cost of mine closure and reclamation. Uh, for example, a mine can close after the second year, uh, leaving a high level of contamination with insufficient funding. Um, I do not think this has been addressed. And just my general comments, um, that, um, you'll be hearing many variations on these as you go through the day. Um, Reputable, reputable scientists say it's possible to carry out a procedure without harming the environment. That does not mean that the procedure will, in fact, be carried out that way. And I think we're all very aware of that. And I've given some examples that have been alluded to already. Second, it's not clear to me from reading the rules how long a mining operation should be allowed to take to complete the treatment of water contaminated by the mining operation. The board should require mining companies to complete post-closure wastewater treatment within 10 years after mine closure, lack of evidence to the contrary, and this is obviously a major uh, contention, uh, but uh, I have opinions about that. Three, um, the requirements for groundwater testing in the vicinity of mining operation are unclear to me. The monitoring wells must be close enough to the actual mine to reflect contamination. Um, it seemed to me that 100 feet was reasonable, but given the geography of certain areas, it may be variable. Uh, this is a standard used for landfills. And finally, experience with metallic mines in other areas of the country show that only 10 to 20 percent of them operate in a way that meet water quality standards. Uh, we've heard that this is a new era. On the other hand, we has to have extremely uh, cautious rules. Um, and finally, I think most important of all, uh, many people agree that it's not reasonable to ask Maine taxpayers to assume the potential burden that might remain after operation closes. Maine taxpayers, national taxpayers, um, we need to rules to assure that all risk is borne by the mining company. Um, thank you very much. Happy to answer questions. Questions for the good senator. Representative Campbell. Thank you, Senator. Um, I want you to know we miss you. The seat That's my has, seat right there. The seat has not been. I'll, I'll come around. No, right over here. It was right here. I, I know you're old, but you were right there. No, you were no right I was there. No, you were there. No. Oh. I am old. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Talk. If, if I might continue. This, this seat has been empty since you left. Yeah. So we miss you. Get health and human services. Um, in terms of, of uh, your point, a uh, bullet, KKK. Yep. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Ooh. Um, 
<laughs> now I've lost my place here. Uh, talking about the uh, floodplains and yes. the fact that it should be uh, taken into consideration. Maybe it wasn't KK. 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 No. Yes, that's right. Okay. Um, how would you suggest we do that? I'm, I'm, I'm not a geologist. I shouldn't. You should, I have my personal opinions, but I, I think that's again an area where real technical. Um, geo, and, and there are many people here. I think will answer that question better than I. Uh, but I know that as we went through our hearings, that was one of the issues was raised, and I wasn't satisfied with definitions. Thank you. Sorry, I, I can't be. I should. I should not be more specific. Thank you. And then, uh, Chris, and then I'll ask if there are any others. Other questions. Senator, I, I do want to thank you because you met the spirit of what we really are asking for. Right. This is very helpful to us. My pleasure. Enjoy your day. It'll be, uh, uh, by the way, uh, Senator, uh, it'll be double. Double. <laughs> double. All in favor of double? <laughs> thank you very much, right, Senator. You'll, you'll each get two M&Ms as yeah. opposed to one. <laughs> Representative Chapman. Senator Johnson. And then do we have someone else here, another representative that wants to testify? Uh, representative Baer said that he had another obligation, but he plans to return. Well, when he does, we'll let him come up. I saw Representative Burstein. I did see her come in, and she's still here. Oh, okay. Representative Hickman was in and out. But if they come back, so the audience knows, we usually let legislators speak. So if they do come back in during the hearing, when we get a break, we'll let them go. Yeah, and, and, uh, and Senator Brakey, so everybody knows, he has probably the worst committee in this place, Health and Human Services. So he meets about six days a week and Sunday sometimes. So that's why Eric is not here. Senator. Good morning. Senator Saviello, Representative Welch, and members of the Joint Standing Committee on Environment and Natural Resources. I'm Senator Chris Johnson, representing State Senate District 13 in the Midcoast region. I'm testifying in opposition to LD-146, resolve regarding a legislative review of Chapter 200, Metallic Mineral Exploration, Advanced Exploration and Mining, a major substantive rule of the Department of Environmental Protection. I think that's in the running for being longer than the OA committee title. Uh, February two, 24th, 2014, I testified on these rules, which were soundly not accepted by the House and Senate. Since the problems with these rules haven't changed, some of what I have to say about them will be the same, too. Um, first of all, Tom Whittle, a constituent residing in Booth Bay Harbor and a career civil sanitary engineer with 44 years of experience in the design and operation of wastewater treatment facilities for municipal and industrial clients wrote to me concerned about the rules being considered by the committee today. And he offered this firsthand knowledge. I'm also an avid outdoorsman and active in Trout Unlimited and other organizations that protect, work to protect Maine's environmental resources. Prior to moving to Maine from Pennsylvania, our Trout Unlimited chapter was involved in the construction and operation of a stream acid limestone treatment system on a valuable trout stream in a remote area. This system, while relatively simple, requires weekly maintenance by volunteers and approximately 100 tons of limestone shoveled into the treatment chamber annually. Mines in the area were abandoned in 1880, yet it wasn't until the 1970s that the fishery was impacted. The treatment system was first installed in 1987 and expanded in 2000. It is expected to be needed in perpetuity to control acid in the stream. He went on to say, my concern with this bill is quite simple. The rules are not protective and should be rejected. There is a very great potential that the rules as proposed will result in the need for the citizens of Maine to be faced with either loss of valuable resources or the burden of treatment over generations long after the mines and any jobs resulting from them are gone. The potential contaminants from mining in Maine will not be remediated with simple acid treatment processes. He's right. Arsenic is also very high in Maine's ore deposits and would require more complex treatment. While his knowledge of treatment facilities and direct experience with acid mine drainage contamination of waterways may be rare, the opinion that these rules are entirely inadequate are shared by the many constituents that have written to me about this resolve. The DEP proposed draft rules on 
rules to BEP that were too weak to protect Maine surface and groundwater, too weak to protect Maine from a perpetual treatment time bomb and costs, and too weak to keep Maine from paying the price tag for mitigating the likely acid and arsenic ecological disaster. I testified before the BEP in 2013 for strengthening those rules and addressing those issues, and their response was to make the rules even worse. The rules in the DEP presume contamination and accept that ground and surface water contamination will extend beyond the mining site. Cynically, they would preclude appropriate intervener status for citizen groups, a substantive change that was slipped in without opportunity for public comment. I'm here to tell you that Maine is admired by people across this country for the pristine nature of our natural places. To tell you that the people not only visiting but living here working in jobs dependent upon the uncontaminated nature of our resources, expect better than this. Maine people do not take kindly to ignoring their extensive testimony before the BEP on the need to strengthen the rules while listening to out-of-state profit-motivated interests asking for a weakening of the rules. Furthermore, LD 146 is improperly before this committee. Under Maine's Administrative Procedures Act, the DEP proposed rules must have a public hearing and typically changes made based on public comments before proceeding to the legislature. In 2013-2014, that process was followed, although not properly executed. For this rule submission, it did not happen. The AG's office said, and I quote, in light of these statutory provisions, we believe the resubmission of the provisionally adopted mining rules about one year after the date of the board's provisional adoption where the agency originally filed the rule with the legislature on January 10, 2014. The resolve disapproving final adoption was vetoed and the veto was sustained and where a new rulemaking process was not initiated is inconsistent with intent and language in MAPA. I understand that members of this committee intend to add notwithstanding language to make review by this committee technically legal. However, I would ask every member of this committee whether bypassing Public involvement in accordance with the MAPA is the way our government should function. Other than decreasing opportunity for public involvement, which helps mining interests reduce public awareness and participation, what possible purpose does violating the Maine Administrative Procedures Act in this way serve? It's wrong. As representatives of the people, it is our duty to stand up for open, transparent, and due processes. The public not only cares what we do here, but how we do it. Please remember that before casting your vote on such a notwithstanding amendment. And I'm here to make plain that expecting to slip environmentally disastrous rules into place without due process and disenfranchising citizens groups as interveners are both unacceptable and disreputable. In 2014, the House and Senate voted resoundingly to reject these same rules because they were inadequate protect Maine's environment, wildlife, and groundwater from disaster, and Maine's taxpayers from the cost of dealing with it. What has changed since then? Not the rules. Meanwhile, the Mount Polly open pit copper and gold mine disaster in the Caribou region of British Columbia happened in August 2014. With a partial breach of the Tailings Pond Dam releasing 10 million cubic meters of water and 4.5 million cubic meters of slurry, a review panel concluded that fundamental changes must be made to the way mines are permitted and tailings ponds designed. But the DEP's rules were not changed to address those findings. Were their permitting and design process requirements even examined by Maine DEP for lessons learned? With an MAPA hearing, I'm sure someone would have made that suggestion. The USGS has documented historical trends from 1950 to 2006 toward increasing summer precipitation, base flows, and storm flows for unregulated streams in much of New England. Increases were large, greater than 20 percent. In fact, they also said uh, they were even larger for the southern Maine, Portland area. And the Maine and the American Society of Civil Engineers concluded in a 2010 study that there is a trend, a strong increase in the magnitude of extreme precipitation in northern coastal New England in the last few decades. They revised upward by one inch, the 100-year, or more properly, 
1% annual probability storm, with coastal 24-hour precipitation depth for Maine exceeding 7 inches and southern Maine exceeding 8 inches. ASCE said this study, as well as recent record-breaking events in northern New England, strongly suggests the need for updating of design storm estimates. Furthermore, extreme precipitation events of longer than one day duration have caused large-scale flooding in the region over the last decade. The magnitude of longer duration storms, particularly two-day storms, may also be increasing, calling for engineered infrastructure that can, can accommodate increases in both storm magnitude and duration. That makes the rule requirement for 24-hour, 500-year storm inadequate. It should, at a minimum, set a 48-hour storm standard. But even more importantly, these studies mean that approval must consider and require adequate engineering to handle the significant annual rainfall increase, not as a new steady state, but as an ongoing trend. The planned and permitted life of the mine, as well as reclamation and closure period, are not constrained in these rules. Yet clearly, designs for tailings, ponds, or other mine drainage must be engineered adequately for both the higher annual precipitation and higher severity rainfall events over both of these time frames and beyond. With no time frame, those critical design factors are moving targets. There are no requirements for fixed time frames nor upwardly trending design capacity requirements in the rules. It's a recipe for failure, for disaster. The lack of such considerations in these rules shows them for what they are wishful thinking, not sound oversight, and inadequate to ensure statutory requirements are met. Even with improvements for these and other technical issues, there is another major failing to these rules. They fail to require appropriate risk assessments and make sufficiently moderate risk of significant environmental damage a necessary condition to permit approval. The kinds of sulfide ore with very high arsenic levels present in Maine present severe risk of water quality impact. That, in effect, is the assessment of SRK Bolladin and DEP Blackhawk for the Bald Mountain deposit. Prospective ways of solving the inherent problems to reduce risks must address the time scale, climate trends, hydrogeological circumstances, and environmental stewardship. Simply said, for ore like we have in Maine with reactive sulfide and high arsenic levels, in circumstances such as the Bald Mountain deposit, that likely means no open pit methods. Regardless, a go, no go decision regarding issuance of a permit must take risk into account. Wishful thinking and mining company promises are not a replacement for due diligence. The natural resources we have in Maine and the many lives and many jobs dependent on the quality of those resources as they depend upon the quality of those resources as they have for generations and will always be more important than mining company profits and a small number of jobs for a few years. The character of this place and its pragmatic stewardship by mean people are what we keep for each other and leave for future generations. You have an opportunity to be a part of that stewardship and ensure that Maine's reputation and natural resource economy have a bright future. Or you can bless a tainted process and a weak set of rules by which you will be remembered. What sort of future do you see for Maine, and what shall be your legacy? Sulfide ore metallic <coughs> mining is something we need to do right or not do at all, because Maine's slogan is not, I remember it before the acid and arsenic spoil it. Our slogan is, the way life should be. These rules deserve rejection, period. Thank you for listening. Questions for the good senator. Senator Representative Martin. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Senator. Uh, your last statement, uh, uh, I think, gets to the point. Um, Suffolk or uh, mining is something we need to do right or not at all. I fully agree with that. I will simply say, in addition to that, if you're from Aroostook, we say Aroostook the way Maine used to be. <laughs> Isn't that so? <laughs> Any other questions? Mike, Mike, uh, Representative Duchesne. Thank you, uh, Senator. Something I'm going to puzzle over and probably take up with the AG's office, too. 
about the Administrative Procedures Act, there's a lot being said about the fact it took a year. A year has passed since the rules were originally adopted and they weren't resubmitted. But the legislature hasn't been in session since last April. So who are they going to resubmit them to in order right. to so that deadline? The problem is not whether they were resubmitted, but whether they re reinitiate a main Administrative Procedures Act process for rulemaking, uh, which involves their posting information and an opportunity for a public hearing and public participation. Last time around, that happened while in the fall and you know, November, December time frame uh, of 2013. So it doesn't have to be when the legislature is in session. In fact, it has no relationship with the legislature's status. Um, that Administrative Procedures Act process begins, and when they are through with following that process and the hearings and the revision to the rules, uh, in accordance with what they've heard and what they've decided is appropriate based on that, then it gets submitted to the legislature for review. So the complaint isn't the year waiting period. The complaint is they should have gone back to the drawing board without any actual direction, or what? They should have, on their own accord, as they did the first time around, submitting rules, doing rulemaking. There's a well, the first time around, because we, we told them to. Told them to. <laughs> <laughs> But they did not yet have rules. So any time that the rules are rejected, and this is a slightly odd case because there was a, a clause in the statute about they're not going into force if not rejected. Right. So in spite of the vetoing of the rejection of the rules, um, the rules are uh, did not go into force. Mm -hmm. um, for that circumstance, were they rejected as the means for they're not going into force? they would then have to begin the Made Administrative Procedures Act process over again. Whether they choose to update the rules before entering into that process or not, certainly there have been things happen, uh, such as the, you know, the tailing dam f failure. Uh, the information I cited, which is actually predates the first round of rules regarding ASCE findings on trends for storm severity and uh, magnitude of precipitation you know, would be good things for them to have taken into account. Well, thank you. Uh, Other questions? Thank you, Senator. You're welcome. Representative Chapman. Thank you and good morning. Uh, Senator Saviello, Representative Welsh, other members of the Joint Standing Committee on the Environment and Natural Resources. My name is Ralph Chapman from Brooksville, the state representative for House District 133, the only House district in Maine that has had any metal mines in the last century. Additionally, I'll mention that, uh, to my knowledge, I'm the only published research scientist in the physical sciences uh, that's in the legislature at the present time. I published too. In the physical sciences? Yes, yeah, soils. Oh, I apologize. Thank you. And I will clarify that I have There's no expertise. Things. There's I have twos. no expertise in mining, but I have uh, written, reviewed, and read many scientific publications. And I bring that point forward because one of the points I'd like to make is that scientific expertise is needed in a techn technologically complex area as, as this one. And I uh, hope that we can provide mechanisms by which that expertise is actually accessed. I will not repeat my two pages of testimony that I provided a year ago to you uh, because I provided that to you individually a few weeks ago, and the clerk is giving you a copy of that testimony again now. Uh, so I'm going to confine my remarks today in conformity with the Maine Administrative Procedure Act, Title V, Chapter 375, and specifically with Subchapter 2A, Section 8072, Number 4, which says in part, quote, the committee's review must include, but is not limited to, a determination of unquote, and then it lists eight items labeled A through H. I will be speaking to items B, E, and G, starting with item G, quote, 
whether the provisionally adopted rule was proposed in compliance with the requirements of this chapter, uh, unquote. From my conversation with the Attorney General's office, this matters before you in violation of the Maine Administrative Procedure Act, specifically Title V, Chapter 375, Subchapter 2A, Section 8071 and 8072. These provisions of state law require the public have an opportunity to be heard before the agent promulgating the rules, a major substantive rule. Um, that is to say, the public has the opportunity to have input into the process at the department level prior to it coming here. The loss of public confidence in the legislative process is exacerbated by your willingness to take up this matter in which the public has been denied, denied their legally sanctioned right. Uh, a potential consequence of proceeding in violation of the main Administrative Procedure Act is the public expense of a judicial review as provided in Title V, Chapter 375, Subchapter 7, Section 11006, Paragraph 1-C. I consider it relevant that the Board of Environmental Protection's report to this committee dated January 2015 does not contemplate submission of these rejected rules in this session. Any member of this committee may object to this illegal proceeding. I rec recommend that each of you do so explicitly. I'd like to add to the information on the discussion that we've had already this morning about the violation uh, with the Maine Administrative Procedure Act and the uh, nature of the communication that you've received from the Office of the Attorney General and how that relates to what happens to these rules. As I understand from my conversations and from the reading of the Maine Administrative Procedure Act, these rules cannot go into effect, even if this committee were to approve them and if the House and Senate were to approve them, without the signature of the Attorney General's office acknowledging that they have been done in accordance with the Maine Administrative Procedures Act. So the fact that the AG's office is saying that they have not been done in accordance with the act means that they would, and they've told me they will not sign off on it, which means the rules could not go into effect. Now, I know, and you as a committee, uh, individual members may know, the public probably does not recognize that the legislature is in kind of a unique position with respect to violation of the law since we are the ones that write the laws. It is possible for us at any given time to make a law that overrides the law that is on the books. And so it's certainly possible for us to decide to override the Maine Administrative Procedure Act in this case in order to make the actions of this legislature legal. But what does that really mean? That means that the legislature is not following the policy of providing an opportunity for the public to have input into the rulemaking process as provided by statute. And uh, I, 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 I can't stress the importance of our not only being concerned with the issue before us, but we are also concerned with the confidence that the public has in the ability of their government to serve uh, those who are governed. Now, moving to item B, I said I would be speaking to three of the statutorily required items for you to consider. Uh, that was item G. Uh, moving to item B, quote, whether the provisionally adopted rule is in conformity with the legislative intent of the statute the rule is intended to implement, unquote. The legislative intent of Title 38, Chapter 3, Subchapter 1, Article 9 can be found in the repeated phrase, Section 490-NN1-A, quote, to protect human health and the environment, unquote. This applies, as stated in 490-NN1, quote, in all areas of the state, including the unorganized territory, unquote. The department's provisionally accepted rules before you rejected by the 126 legislature are not in conformity with a stated legislative intent as they cannot protect either human health or the environment from the mining of volcanogenic massive sulfide deposits in Maine. In particular, this can be shown conclusively 
by answering the following straightforward questions. One, were these rules in effect at the time? Would they have prevented the problems created by the mining effort at the Open Pit Callahan Mine in Brooksville? Number two, were these rules in effect at the time? Would they have prevented the problems created by the underground mining effort at the Kerr American Mine in Brooksville? Both of those in my district. And importantly, three, could these rules prevent problems at the Bald Mountain Deposit in Aroostook County were it to be mined under these rules? The answer to all these questions is no. You may notice that the answer to the first two questions requires that you know something about what did go badly at the mines in my district. And the answer to the third question requires an understanding of why the Bald Mountain Deposit has been found by the industry to be too risky to mine without severe damage to the environment. I'd be happy to help any member of this committee understand these matters. Uh, I don't want to take up your time today, but I have a tremendous amount of information on all three of those questions I'd be happy to share with you at any time. The rules provide for anticipated ad activities that violate the legislative intent. Ex examples of these can be found especially in the section on closure and post-closure. Significantly, the post-closure period is far less than the time period over which experience in Maine has shown the onset of weathering initiated contamination of surface water uh, when it begins. Now, at this point has come out a couple of times. Let me explicitly state what the difficulty is in mining the volcanogenic massive sulfides, which is that they are re that these are these are deposits that are where they are today because they were formed 300, 500 million years ago. They have been protected from an aqueous oxidizing environment for hundreds of millions of years. And when we open them up, we allow moisture and air to get at them, which creates a chemical reaction, which then creates an acid that leaches the metals that can run into the surface waters and the groundwater. That's the difficulty. The problem here is that that weathering, the weathering events that create that problem can create that problem not necessarily immediately. Um, and I use as an example uh, the mine in my hometown, uh, the Callahan Mine. A paper was published just a couple of years ago. I'm sorry. Did I turn him off? Shouldn't have. Should the button again? I shouldn't have. No. I guess it's good. I don't know how that happened. I was about to say that uh, a, po a point source, uh, an unknown source, uh, but a point source pollution of heavy metal contamination into the estuary next to the waste rock piles at the Callahan mine was discovered a couple of years ago. The mine closed 40 years ago. So we have a situation in which a new problem is developing due to the weatherization of the waste pile rock. So what's really needed in order to do the mining correctly is a plan in which the long-term geologic stability of the area is taken into account and preserved. And that's what's, of course, missing in these rules. And then finally, turning to item E, quote, whether the provisionally adopted rule is reasonable, especially as it affects the convenience of the general public or of persons particularly affected by it, unquote. The general public is very greatly inconvenienced by these rules insofar as the rules if put into effect can easily result in a million year contamination of large areas of the state's watershed from unmitigated acid mine drainage. The rules do not contain the word proven, as in proven technologies nor the phrase, quote, best practices, unquote, in relation to the prevention of weathering of waste rock. Allowance of unproven technologies using less than best practices inconveniences the public by subjecting them to probable unknown risks, both acute and long term. I'm happy to answer your questions now or at any time. All right, let's try now. You still got your contact? All right. There. I'm back again. Were you in the legislature on January 
29th when this, the 29th, I'm sorry. Yeah, 29th when this came through in the House before it was sent to the Senate? Yes, I was. Was there a roll call that day? No, there was not. And the same in the Senate, there was no roll well, call? Well, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to tell you what the history was. I heard the bill coming through and I said to myself, there's a problem. But that was prior to my conversation with the Attorney General's office. So I was not aware of the magnitude of the problem of the rules coming before us improperly. Uh, I was aware of it prior to them coming to the Senate. I know that the Senate, uh, they were tabled in the Senate for that reason. Um, they were taken off the table two days later. I had thought they were tabled in the Senate for the purposes of getting an opinion from the Attorney General. but. And I, I am not aware that that had happened uh, when they were taken off the table. So I can't speak to what happened in the Senate. I was not there. I believe on Friday of that week, the Representative Welsh and Representative uh, Martin met with the Attorney General and came back in with the guidance that we could proceed with this if the legislature sent it to us. Um, I was not at the meeting that they had with the Attorney General. I spoke with the Attorney General after they met with the Attorney General, and I know what the Attorney General's office said to me. And I'm reporting to you that what I was told differed from the story I heard of what had happened at their meeting, but I can't vouch for what happened at their meeting. And the story as I understood directly from Mary Sauer of the Attorney General's office is that the Attorney General would not sign off on these rules because of a violation of the Maine Administrative Procedures Act unless the legislature deliberately overrode the, rule, the law, as I mentioned at the beginning of my statements, that we in the legislature can violate any law we want and just simply declare it to be legal for a specific circumstance. And yes, we can do that, and I absolutely believe we should not do that. Uh, but I'm only one of 186 of us. So uh, uh, just, just, uh, just for, 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 your, for your own edification, both came to us unanimously. They gave us permission to move forward, and it should have been objected to in the House uh, and in the Senate. It was objected to in the Senate. There was a mini debate, but there was no roll call asked for. So we have them properly before us. And yes, you're right. We will have to have withstanding language in there. But at the end of the day, that's why we don't pay the 55 percent. That's why we don't do a lot of things. So I hope that you'll support all of those things we go for. Isn't that well, so? Well, I would answer your question by suggesting that in spite of the reference to your committee by the House and the Senate in their wisdom or in their error, it is your ability to choose whether or not to proceed. And this committee has that option before them to declare this procedure and inappropriate and to discontinue this procedure. I have recommended to each of you individually to state your objection to it. And the other point that I mentioned, I'll repeat, is that your continued violation of the Maine Administrative Procedure Act provides grounds for a judicial review. Um, I think it's better public policy to have a process that generates the policy that is um, less likely to require the third uh, branch of government's involvement uh, when at all possible. Representative Harlow. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Good morning, Ms. Representative Chapman. Um, we've had several conversations about this particular bill, um, as anyone who knows us would probably guess. And one of the conversations we had after this was referenced before us and was sent to the Senate was we probably, in re looking back on it, we should have asked for a roll call. Um, and we did have that conversation after the fact. So I just wanted to say that more than one legislator did have that conversation. So Don't you. want to belabor the conversation, but we have it before us. Other questions for the representative? If not, thank you very much.